I didn't want to hear a lot of amens there, but you know, a couple would probably, but uh, it can happen. Last week we talked about the good man. How many times have you heard someone say to you when you try to witness to them, you try to talk to them about Christ, well, well I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a good person. And then there's some people, you try to witness to them and they say, well, well I'm, a, I'm a good person. And you want to yell at them, where? When? I, excuse me, but I haven't seen it. You know, I know it may be in there, but it needs to get out of here somewhere. You know, because we're not seeing it. No matter how good your intentions are, the reality of your actions are not good. And we tend to judge other people by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. But good intentions are not sufficient. Now, good intentions, good intentions and a good heart under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is covered by grace. I want you to catch what I'm saying here. Good intentions and a good heart under God is covered by grace. But good intentions and a good heart outside of God is not covered by grace. I mean, even at our best, we're going to need God's grace. Even at our best, we're going to need God's mercy. So you better stay under the blood. But I want to, we went through how that we tend to concentrate on people who have all kinds of debilitating struggles when we many times forget that just the average person has their own internal struggles with self. And there are good people who are striving and trying so hard to be good and they're putting up facades when really inside they're torn apart and they're really struggling. We talked about how that we create coping me mechanisms so that we can try to cover up our, our, our shortcomings and, and explain them away or whatever. Uh, when we, we know if we're really honest and we're really open, which you can do with God. That's the beautiful thing about God. You don't have to come and appease God. You just have to come and please God. You, here's the thing. You can please God by simply coming in sincerity and humility and confessing your sins unto Him instead of trying to do some great act that would appease Him. You just simply come and humble yourself before Him, which pleases Him. And so we're all struggling with our different things. Reality is good people struggle with guilt. If you're struggling with guilt, I, I want to commend you. Because if you weren't struggling with guilt over your, your, your evil, then you would be a hypocrite. Or you would be a, an apostate. Apostate, or you would be a, a sociopath because you feel no, no guilt. People say, I don't want to go to church where there's a bunch of hypocrites. Well, see, a bunch of hypocrites are people who think they're holy when they're not. If you're a person who knows you're struggling and you're admitting that and you're continuing to struggle with it, you're not a hypocrite. That's a lie the devil loves to sell you. Well, don't you go to church because you're a hypocrite because you ain't living like you ought to. Yeah, but you know that and you're, you're, you're not happy with it and you're struggling with it. Keep coming and keep struggling. You're not a hypocrite. The hypocrite is the one where you try to tell them they're struggling and they go, no, I'm not. No, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. You're going, no, you're not. Now, as we look at this, we talked about how we struggle that many times we try to deny because we just can't accept reality because reality is not pretty. We don't like to accept reality about ourselves or even the world. I mean, our world and the state it's in and what's happening in our world, it's hard for us to even cope with what's going on in the world. Now, Sometimes, so we try to deny it away. We try to rationalize it away. We try to explain it away. But you can't explain it away. You say, I don't even know what people in the world without an understanding of God do with a lot of stuff. How do you explain ISIS if there is no God and there is no Satan? What do you do with that? I mean, I, pure evil... When you, when you go back and you study about the Nazis and what they did and everything else and you go back through history and you see the brutality and the cruelty and the everything, if there is no God, if there is no Satan, if there is no struggle of good and evil, then what in the world is going on? Just blow this place up and let's get it over with. Now, so anyway, we make excuses. 
I can't bear the truth, so I just excuse my... I blame it on somebody else. I blame it on something else. And, of course, you can hear much more detail in this if you go back and uh, you listen to last week's sermon. And I apologize for a couple of typos, which I've now corrected, that my wife pointed out to me. She's a good wife. She keeps me on my toes. Oh, by the way, did you know there were a couple of mistakes up there? I didn't, or I would have corrected them. It's kind of like the other day I heard somebody talking about they went to the airport and they said, did someone put things in your bag that you're not aware of? Well, if I'm not aware of it, I guess I wouldn't know it. And the person went, point well taken, move along. <laughs> I'm like, that really is a dumb question. Did someone put things in your bag you're not aware of? How would I know that? I'm not aware of it. But anyway. It's just a thought. My brain ping-pongs around every now and then. Just think, my wife has to live with that. But uh, <laughs> secular psychologists come up with all kinds of ways to help us cope with who we are because they don't believe that we can change. Because they don't believe in a supernatural power of God that can transform us. So we tend to be a people of medication rather than salvation. And God wants to change us. You see, I can't stand to stay who I am. He doesn't intend for you to stay who you are. He means to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. He doesn't leave you where you are. He didn't come to keep me and save me or to hold me and keep me in my sins. He came to deliver me from my sins. He came to change and transform me. God doesn't rationalize our failures. He releases us from them. He forgives us. God, and we see that in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. God doesn't numb us in our guilt. He removes it from us. I mean, the world just wants to give you enough dope that you, you can cope with life because you're numb. You see, God heals the sickness. God does what he heals what's causing the pain. I'm facing surgery on Wednesday on my shoulder. You know, and, and, and because of the type problem it is with bone spurs and stuff, I just looked at the doctor and I shared this last week. I said, well, if you're just going to give it injections and shots and give me pills and all, is that any of that going to make it any better? No, it'll just make it more tolerable. I said, I ain't into that program. You know, let's just get on with it. Well, the surgery's painful. I said, so is this. Let's just get on with it and get it over. Let's, let's, let's try to fix it. You see, I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. I want to live. Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, not just survive. And so God comes to give us victory. And so as we look at this, godly sorrow bringeth forth repentance that leads to salvation and that leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow just brings us to death. Look, you may be sorry for what you've done, but you will die in that sorrow. It will destroy you. Grief is killing people. If you can't deal with grief, continually studies have shown that one of the reasons people have longevity is they've learned how to cope with tragedy. If you can't cope with tragedy, if you can't cope with failure, if you can't deal with grief, it will kill you. It will kill you. It doesn't rationalize, it doesn't remove the con uh, rationalization does not remove the consequences of sin. And even though you explain it away or excuse it away or whatever, there are still consequences. But here's the beautiful thing about God. Even though I have consequences of my sin, he, he takes those sins and he puts them on his son, Jesus Christ. You see, the, <laughs> you say, well, well, that's not right because that person... There was no punishment for their sin. Yes, there was. They got saved and that punishment was put on Christ. So when you want to see them suffer, see the suffering Christ on the cross. There was a penalty for sin, but Jesus paid it. Hallelujah. He paid mine. He paid yours. In your mind, the devil will try to tell you, well, that's just not right to just be forgiven. No, it's not right. It's not just. It's not fair. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's called grace. It's called mercy. It ain't right. I like that. That's a good old Southern saying. And this ain't right. Oh, it's not right. I wasn't right. But God forgave me and he made me right. Paul said, I stand in the righteousness is not my own, but one that's been given me by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's a gift of grace that God has given to you. I'm going to preach for it all over. Hallelujah. 
See Isaiah chapter 53, he hath borne all of our griefs and our sorrows and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. You see, God has already borne all the penalty of your sin. So quit trying to be a good person on your own and just take whatever goodness you have and then whatever not goodness you have, which you've got some, and just bring it to God and lay it all there before him and then you are covered by grace. And at the end of yourself, there is His grace. You give it your all, you give it all you got, but then you know even at your best you're going to fail, but that's where grace comes in because a good person under God is covered by grace. But if you're a good person on your own, trying to do it on your own, there is no grace, there is no covering, there's just you. And then you're going to struggle with all of those things that the world tries to help you with to cope with who you are and what you are instead of allowing God to change you and transform you. Now... Have you ever wondered why good people often struggle with anger? And this is why we, where we kind of started wrapping up last week. It's because we're frustrated. We're frustrated with ourselves. Do y'all ever get mad at yourself? I get mad at myself all the time. You know, sometimes my wife, why are you so mad? I'm mad at me. You know, I am. I just get mad at me. I just get just like, I have to, I have to correct myself sometimes. I even sometimes the Lord has to tell me to quit criticizing my own self. Now, some of you may that might sound crazy, but some of you, you actually could have said amen, but you're afraid to. <laughs> you're criticizing, your own, you're beating your own self up. You'll walk around for a half a day beating yourself up. When God says, hey, quit talking about my child like that. You see, God will correct you about yourself. I know that sounds kind of strange, but he'll do that. Quit talking about yourself like that because you're mine and you're redeemed and I got a bigger plan for you and that ain't what, that's not what I'm speaking over you. You quit listening to yourself. Some of you need to quit listening to yourself. And so God begins to speak over our lives. They're good people overall, but they struggle with rage because something's always getting in the way and the problem is it's them. And them, they go with themselves wherever they go. So there's no getting away from it. Have you figured that out? I can't get away from myself. Everywhere I go, I just look around and there I am. You know, there I am in the midst of me. <laughs> Wherever I go. And so I have to learn how to deal with self and that's where God's grace and God's mercy comes in. It's not because you're a bad person. If you're a bad person, you wouldn't be struggling with it. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 1 says that they knew they were doing wrong, but they took pleasure in it. See, they weren't struggling with it. They love it. An apostate, an apostate person doesn't care what they're doing is wrong. They're liking it. They're loving it. They're flaunting it. And let me tell you something. If you're there, you're in real danger because you don't even know you're wrong anymore. You don't even care anymore. So thank God you got a conscience. Thanks God that you're struggling, but thank God for his grace and his covering that can cover you. Now I want to go on from there because God's union with our mortality brings about what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now I want to talk about this other problem we have. Idiots. I'm not going to look at a soul in this place right now. You know what I'm talking about? You ever had a struggle with an idiot? Matter of fact, one, one author wrote a book, How to Argue with Idiots. How do you argue with an idiot? I don't know. Sometimes it's really difficult because they don't get it. And some of you are working with them. Some of you are having to deal with them. Some of you are living with them. And don't punch your mate. <laughs> Amen, brother. Preach it. It's hard. It's like one saying once said, hey, it's hard to fly like an eagle, it's hard, to, hard to soar like an eagle when you're flying with turkeys. You know, turkeys don't fly, by the way. But, uh, you know, they found that out at Candlestick Park years ago. This really happened. Somebody got the bright idea that on Thanksgiving they were going to throw turkeys out of a little plane for people for Thanksgiving, not knowing turkeys can't fly. It was bad. It was bad. It was ugly. They never did that again. There's people probably still traumatized to this day seeing horrified turkeys coming down. <laughs> Just don't picture it in your mind. It's frightening. <laughs> I 
It's going to take me a second to get the turkeys out of my mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm twisted, but it's just that way. I got to get the turkeys out of my mind. Give me a second. God knows when you're sincere and when others are not. Now, I want to tell you how to deal with idiots. I want to tell you how to be a good man in the midst of evil people. How do you do that? Because it's one of the most frustrating things in the world. First of all, you need to understand the first struggle with our salvation is the willingness to face my inadequacies and guilt. The second step is to recognize and accept the ability of God to forgive me of my sins. The third step is to recognize God's power through the Holy Spirit to enable me to overcome my sinful nature. Now those all take place within us. But how do I deal with the world around us? And, and it's not, you know, I don't have a problem dealing, well, I, uh, yeah, sometimes I do, but I can deal with stuff like inanimate things and wood. and stuff. I like working with wood and metal and stuff because it's just going to do whatever you do with it. And you may struggle with it, but if you have ability, you can overcome it. But people, it's like herding cats. I mean, yeah, how do you do that? You know, people, you try to get them going one direction, and boom, there they go, just, you know. You get them all in there and situated, and suddenly they go in the other room. So as we see, we begin to overcome our old nature, and then we run into another roadblock, other people. We start getting a handle on self. And some of you, God has done a work of grace in your life. And thank God for that. And God has done a lot in your life. But now your struggle is, is those folks around you. Now, Mercy House especially, guys, listen to me. Once God really starts doing a work in your life, you've gotten through step one. God's helping you to deal with yourself. But the problem is, uh, by God's grace and by God's design and by God's purpose, he's put you in Mercy House with all those other idiots. <laughs> and you've got to learn how to deal with that. You in life, God sometimes will put an idiot in your life right next to you. Now, I don't recommend that you go to somebody that you work with and go, my pastor said you're an idiot. <laughs> I, I don't recommend you to do that. For your own sake, and especially for mine, don't do that. But God sometimes, my dad calls them, called them grace builders. He said, son, some, I, you know, sometimes I'd be ranting about a person. He said, son, that's a grace builder. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's one of them people that God just puts in your life because you need to learn grace. They don't deserve me. Well, see, grace means they don't deserve it, so he's got to put some people in there. Some of you say, yeah, but you don't understand how dumb they are. That's why they need grace. So God may put somebody right beside you to help you learn how to deal with difficult people so that difficult people don't derail you spiritually. Now, as we look at this, we can become frustrated with foolishness, other people's foolishness. They can cause all kind of problems for you. They said, but the problem is these people, they get in my way. They cause me all kinds of problems I can't do. Well, one of the things is you've got to begin to look at life through the proper lens. You've got to begin to look at life through the understanding of the scriptures and God's place that he has put us in in Christ Jesus. And many of us, this is a place that I believe God has really laid upon my heart that God wants to help us live in victory. Some of you have somewhat come to grips with your sin. But you, what you haven't come... And, and, and I believe there are people who are here uniquely and particularly for this word. I, I really sensed in my spirit. Last week I felt like there were, there were specific people that God intended to be here because they needed to hear that last week. They needed to hear because they're good people and they're really struggling. I believe there's some other people who are here today who they are, you are here uniquely because God wants you to hear what I'm about to share. You're struggling. You're not really struggling with whether to be a sinner or not. You're just struggling, period. And, and you don't even necessarily understand all of your struggles. But... Remember that God knows everything happening to you right now. And he knows what you have or have not done along with the sincerity of your heart. 
He knows when others are the cause of your failure. Listen very carefully. He knows when others are the cause of your failure and though you have done all that you could. And when I want to stop right here. When I'm talking about your failures, I'm not talking about sin. Okay, can you, for a minute, I want you to understand your, your, your inadequacies just in life, okay? You see, I can be dysfunctional and be a Christian. I want to say that again. I can be dysfunctional and be a Christian. I can be crazy and be a Christian. I can be an idiot and be a Christian. Why? Because being a Christian is simple. I didn't say it was easy, and I didn't say we're all doing a good job of it. So just being saved. You are saved. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you're not redeemed. I'm not saying that you haven't had your sins forgiven. I'm not saying that God isn't living in you, but you're living beneath what God has for you. Some of you are a seething rage. You, you're a good person and you love the Lord and you just got a fuse about that long. Okay, well, let me help you. He knows when others are the cause of your failure. And there again, I want to clarify. I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about like at your job, in life, stuff, things, whatever. When others around you cause your failure, and though you have done all that you could, those around you have chosen to reject the truth, act unwisely, behave foolishly, ignore wisdom, refute rationality, spurn common sense, exemplify ignorance, demonstrate stupidity, manifest the mind of a moron, and defy all reason, leaving you void of any explanation. God knows when that's happening. Have you ever looked up at God and said, do you see this? Do you see what's happening here? Here's the amazing thing. I want to let you in on something. He does. He sees every little detail of it. He sees every little intricate part, every thought, even the very intents of their hearts. And there are some people who are just acting out of total emptiness. There's nothing up there. There's nothing in here. It's just, I'm not sure what they're, they're just uh, there. Okay? And God sees that and God knows. God also knows when there are people who are merely acting out because of the pain that they're living with inside. Let me help you with this. There are some people who are very difficult and the reason they're very difficult is because their life has been very difficult and they're really struggling inside. I remember when I was working for McRae's years and years ago. This guy's, I'm sure, long since dead. I was a young man and I was working and I had this boss that was, oh, wow, this guy. I mean, he was terrible. He would yell and scream and cuss at you and everything else. And he was the meanest little old dude. He was about this tall. He was the meanest little dude I ever met in my life. And then one day, his wife drove up around the corner, and I needed to ask him a question. And I went around the corner, and oh my goodness, this woman was, she was tearing that dude into little pieces and stomping on it. She was telling him he was worthless and he was stupid and he was everything and she was just railing at him and ranting at him and he would try to say something. And when she got in her car and slammed the door and drove off, he just turned around and his, his shoulders were down, his head was down. And, and, but by the time he got around that corner where we were, whoo! And something turned over inside of me. And when I left... That man was a dear friend of mine and, I, I, he, and, and God had helped me to speak into his life and to love him because suddenly God broke my heart because I realized the reason that man was as mean as it was because of what all was going on in his life, what all was happening. He was mad. He didn't know where to put it, so he put it on us, unfortunately. So there are people who are struggling with all kinds of stuff and they're putting it on you because they don't know where to put it. And you just happen to be adjacent. So they can put it on you. So have you ever, when, when can, we can then be arrested by frustration and anger. 
we're arrested by frustration and anger when we begin to believe that others' actions control your life. Do you really believe that or do you believe what the scripture says? The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Did you know the Lord can be in your failures? Sometimes it is only in my failures. It is only in my weakness that I'm made strong because I quit depending on me and I began to depend on God. You know Rick and Bubba program? The Rick and Bubba program, I don't know if some of you have heard it. I don't listen to it, but I've listened to it a few times and those guys are nuts. But anyway, Rick and Bubba He was on Fox News and they were interviewing him. And Rick's little two and a half year old boy, I don't know if you remember, you know, walked off into their swimming pool and drowned. It was a terrible tragedy. And they're very dedicated Christians. And this morning, as I was listening to his testimony, this is on Fox News. I I thought it was pretty, pretty incredible. They were openly, he said, I appreciate your boldness to even interview and let me say these things. And praise God for that. He said, in that moment, when we buried our child and I'm so broken and all and I looked and I said, God, I can't do this. He said, God spoke to me and let me know now, now I can do it. Now I can do it. Now you're where I need you to be. His wife was on the program and she said, I was so devastated by our child's birth, our child's death. I mean, she said, you know, but here's what happened. God removed the love of this world so that I could love him and his kingdom more. Through all of this, I've become so much deeper in my relationship with Christ because he tore the world away from me and gave me himself in his place. That, that's some big stuff right there, folks. That's some big stuff right there. But it's true. You see, we, we, we think that... that The enemy controls our life. No, he will frustrate your life, but he does not control your life. The steps of a righteous man are ordered to the Lord. There's a second problem that we have. When you begin to feel that we will be judged according to their actions. (laughs) Well, now, it is true that it works sometimes when you're responsible and they mess it up. The boss doesn't look at them. The boss looks at you. But sometimes the reason they're not doing a good job is because you're not training them well. Just saying, I didn't hear a bunch of amens on that one. I mean, sometimes we are at fault in some of these things, but then sometimes it's not. Sometimes we've shown them a hundred times, and they still do it, or whatever. And, and though it may affect me at work, in the scheme of eternity, keep your focus. In the scheme of eternity, God will never judge you for the actions of another person. So that person can be a a raging fool and cause all kinds of problems for you. But guess what? God's not going to judge you for what they've done. My dad said one time, he said, son, sometimes in a situation, the only redeeming factor is your reaction to it. Whatever happened was terrible and was awful. But your reaction to it can bring redemption to that situation. It can bring something positive to it. And within our lives, sometimes there's stuff that happens to us. Sometimes it's to teach us, to train us, to mold us, to shape us. And sometimes it's because somebody else is not doing what they should do, and we suffer the consequences. The Bible says that the sins of the fathers are visited on the second and third generations. What does that mean? Many of us have inherited grave dysfunction. And we inherit it from our parents that have been handed down to us. But God doesn't mean for you to stay a victim. He means for you to be a victor. And you can overcome it. And I'm going to give you some tools this morning to overcome that victim mentality and that dysfunction. You're mad because you think other people are getting in the way of you being perfect. Get over that. That ain't happening anyway. You're not going to be judged by their actions. If we forget that our reward is based on our obedience, not theirs. Now, it's very important that you understand, I'm rewarded according to my obedience, not my success. They are not synonymous. You see, this world says you are nothing if you're not successful. There are people who have been killed for their faith. In the world's economy, that's not success. You fail to the extent they killed you. But in the eternal economy, they're a champion in Christ Jesus. 
When you look at the life of Joseph, it would appear he was a failure. Sold into slavery, sent to prison for something he didn't even do. But you see, he was very successful because he was in God's economy because he was obedient. And through all of those things, God put him right where he needed to be that in a day's time he went from prison to second in command in all of Egypt. You see, obedience is where it's at. And when you're being obedient, what does that mean? That means if you're at work and some one of these people that I just described messes up everything and you get in all kinds of problems and struggles and difficulties and all, but then you treat them with respect and you don't act the fool. Hey, look, we can all do that, okay? As a pastor, I've had to walk in and apologize to some staff members before. I've even had them at times say, well, I didn't think you really did anything out of line, but my wife told me I did. And you know what? If it even sounds like I'm mean and cruel and whatever, I don't want to, be, I don't want to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be, I'm, you know, got a lot of stress, got a lot of tension on me, but that's not an excuse. That's just a reason. And so I got to ask you to forgive me because I was short and impatient or whatever. And so you see what I'm saying? In that situation, your obedience is where God's going to bless you. You can totally fail at what you're doing, but how you handle that and what you do with it becomes a success in the eyes and the economy of God. And you've got to grasp that. It's about being first before doing. Jesus said, you will be endowed with power from on high and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say you will go and witness. The problem is that there are people out here who are witnessing who aren't being. They're witnessing, but their life doesn't line up and it contradicts the gospel. And because of it, their words are useless and fruitless because they're not bearing fruit in their life. So their words don't bear fruit. Am I getting through to somebody this morning? You see, you got to begin to see things through the eternal economy instead of the way the world looks at it. I can fail in the world's eyes and succeed. I can lose my job because I refuse to lie and to deceive. And in the world's eyes, I'm a failure. But in God's eyes, I was obedient. Now, I want us to go on from here. But I can be crushed by cruelty. But the problem is, some of us, now some of it, I hope this will really help you. You're just struggling with people and stuff and you need to get over that and realize that in the scheme of eternity, it's very small and infinitesimal. Especially if you're a boss over a bunch of people. It's really difficult. Treat them with respect. Treat them with dignity. It's nothing wrong with being firm. It's nothing wrong with being honest and straightforward, but you don't have to yell and scream and cuss and throw fits and break things. Okay? Just speak the truth. Speak it in love. Be strong. Be meek. Not weak. Just me. That's not the same thing. Weakness and meekness, not the same thing. You can tell somebody something very forthright and very strongly, very sternly, and without any question, without yelling. Just simply say, you do that again, you're fired. Oh, pardon me, and, and believe me, I will do exactly what I said. You do that again, you're fired. I've had some staff members in this church that I've, I've gone in and I've said, uh, I, I need to get something really clear with you. You do that again, you're gone. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to allow that to happen because it can cause great dissension and problems within the church. You do that again, you're gone. I'm just, you understand what I'm telling you? Do, 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 do you hear me? And they go, yeah. And then whenever I fired them, they're like, whoa, whoa, what did we do? I said, I you did it again. You did it again. And I told you, if you do that again, you're fired. You're out of here. You're gone. So you're gone. You know, I, I don't have to yell and scream at you and throw you out the door, but, but it's just the reality. So... It, it, and that's not an easy place. And I'm going to tell you, that's any fun. I hate it. I hate that. That's awful. That's terrible. But in the truth of it, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. And it is not wrong. It is right. Because if, if, if you love a child, you're going to discipline them. And sometimes in a business, if, you, if, if you're being responsible for it, you have to deal with people who are incompetent and you have to fire some folks sometimes. Now, as you look here, I want to go on. We can be crushed, however, by cruelty. Let's go on to a deeper level, though. There are some of you who have experienced some stuff in your life that, that boggles the mind. I mean cruel stuff, awful stuff, terrible stuff. You can be broken by brutality. Some of you have suffered brutal things, cruel things, horrible things, things that no one should ever, ever, 
We can be demoralized or demobilized. Now that word, you say, well, wait a minute, you probably meant immobilized. No, demobilized. You see, to be mobilized is to be in service, to be in the service in active duty, to be demobilized is to be taken out of service. I'm telling you, depression and anger and brokenness can act, take you out of the game. Take you out of the game. Take you out of God's will. Take you out of God's place. Take you out of what God has for you because you're, 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 you're frozen by fear. You're broken by brutality. You're just in the midst of all of this and it's tearing you apart. There are things that have happened to some people that I can't even fathom their depth, much less understand what it must be like to carry the scars of what they've gone through. There are things we can't even bear to hear of without it upsetting us greatly, while others must bear the weight of having experienced it. I can't imagine, I can't imagine the things that ISIS is doing. We don't even, you don't even hear it on the news because I don't think we can, even, we can even deal with it. We can even comprehend it. That you would tell people to deny your faith. And if you don't, I'm going to hack your child's head off and hand you their lifeless body. We're talking babies. I can't fathom that. I, even now, many of you are just kind of, it's just not going in the computer. They're taking people and putting them inside of caskets and sealing it up and pouring inflammable liquids and burning them alive inside of steel caskets. They're doing all kinds... The things that don't even make any sense. They're again outside of God and Satan and evil and good. It doesn't even make any sense. Abject terror and horror. I can't imagine going through some of those things. Some of you through child abuse or neglect or whatever. You've gone through, through domestic abuse or a husband or a wife or, or whatever. I don't know what all you've been through. And some of you have been through stuff I can't even imagine going through. I have lived a, a, a rather charmed life when it comes to all of that. I've not faced so much of that. You can be frozen by fear. Let me tell you something. You will be hurt. Things will happen in this life. There will be failures. You play football, you're going to get hurt. You can't play scared. You play scared, you can't play. And every now and then you're going to get hurt. Stuff's going to happen. In this game called life, you got to take the bumps. It's going to happen. Stuff's going to happen. Things going to happen. Jesus said, look, in this world you will have tribulation, even persecution. But don't you fear, for I have overcome this world. He said, no matter what you've got to go through in this world, realize that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I have seen him fall as lightning from the sky, and I have overcome the world. There's stuff's going to happen. But we can be frozen by fear. You have to continue to work on you and allow God, though, to deal with others. Some of you are so afraid of other people that you're frozen in your own development and growth in Christ because you're just afraid you can't deal with other people or things or circumstances. Then we can be bridled with bitterness. Once the devil gets you to a place where you're just overcome by these things that have happened to you in the past, I can either go into depression, I can turn it on myself, or I can get into anger and bitterness. I can be forever angry at what has happened to me, and I can then be haltered by hate, and suddenly my hate begins to rule my life and turn me where I don't want to go and, and, and take me places I don't want to go and, and cause me to do things I don't want to do because I, I'm overcome with the hate. There are some of you, you don't even realize it, but you have a, a vehement hate in you for certain things and certain people. And, and you really, if you're honest, you hate them. You hate them. Let me tell you something. Hate is from the pit of hell. It will destroy you. It will eat you from the inside out. It is a destructive force. Bitterness will bind you up and hold you up and lock you up and not allow God to do His work in your life. I'm not telling you what has happened to you is good or just or right. I'm just telling you, if you clutch it, if you hang on to it, if you hold on to it, if, if, if you, you, you let it turn to bitterness and anger and hate, it will destroy you. How do we overcome the rage toward others? How do we do this? Well, here's some things. Realize that God judges each man on his own merits. you got to leave that person to God. you got to let God judge them. You can't judge them anyway. You're not the judge. No matter how you would like to, you can't. Understand that others act in ignorance and sin. There are many things that Jesus overlooked because he said, I know they act, they're sheep without a shepherd. They act in ignorance because they don't recognize the truth that is right before them. There are many people you need to look at them and realize they just don't even understand what they're doing. 
They don't understand life. They don't understand things. They don't understand about sin. And they don't even understand what's happening in their life. And so it's out of ignorance that they're doing what they're doing. It's not out of cruel intent. It's not out of hatefulness. It's just out of dysfunction that they're doing what they're doing. And let God move you to the point that you have compassion toward them instead of anger and frustration. Thirdly, remember that reward comes with obedience, not success. You can totally fail at something, but do it in such a gracious and godly way that you win and it's a victory in the kingdom of God. Forgiveness then. This is an important one. Forgiveness releases you from their sin. See, when I am forgiven, I'm released of my sin. But when I don't forgive someone else, I bind their sin to me. Now, you need to get this in your spirit. I don't forgive them because they're worthy. I don't forgive them because they deserve it. I forgive them because if I don't forgive them, their sin gets bound to me. <clears throat> Unforgiveness has translated dysfunction from generation to generation because I don't forgive my parents or my grandparents or what all happened in my life because I don't forgive it. I'm, I'm almost just, I'm going to repeat it because I'm bound to it. Some of you need to forgive some parents and you say, man, I want to, I, would have kill, I wish I could have killed them, but they're already dead, or I wish I could kill them. Just forgive them, let it go. It's poisoning you, it's destroying you. You've got to let it go. And you're so fr frustrated and angry because you're, you're, the sin has bound you. It's not even your sin. You say, well, I'm a good person, but, but this happened to me or that happened to me. The problem is that your sin, the problem is their sin. You bound it to yourself. Am I making some sense here? Are y'all getting it? So you can be a really good person, but you're terribly dysfunctional because you won't let it go. Their sin is destroying you. I'm just giving a moment for God by His Holy Spirit to drive this home to some of you. You've been carrying stuff that God never meant for you to carry. He said, give all that to me. Let me be the judge. Let me take care of that. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Turn them over to me. I'll take care of it. Don't you worry about it. You let me have it. You let me be the judge. Forgiveness turns judgment over to God and releases divine power for you to overcome that dysfunction in your life. Some of you got some stuff. Look, I'm believing that God's going to let some people free us from junk this morning. You're good. I look out here. I don't see a bad person in this place. Now, some of you, I may not even know you good enough to know you're a bad person. As far as I know, they ain't, there's no bad people in this place. I can't see a person out here that I see just, I go, man, now that one. You're all good people. But some of you carrying some junk, man. You're dragging this stuff along and it's destroying you. Some of you are there again. You've been judging yourself. You've been beating yourself up. You've been trying because you've been trying to do it on your own. You just need to give it up. Give it to God. Let Him be God in your life. Let Him be merciful to you. And then some of you let, need to let go of that other person's sin. In Ephesians chapter six and verse twelve, we need to understand something. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That that person at work, they're, they're not your enemy. That mom, that dad, that brother, that sister, that cousin, that aunt, that uncle, that husband, that daughter, that son. They're not the enemy. You need to quit taking what should be reserved for Satan and sin and putting it on people because they're not the enemy. It is the sin in them. And I've got to, I've got to hate the one that causes the sin, not the sinner. I, I've got to, I, I, don't, I don't apologize. I hate the devil. I hate him. I think he's the only one that God will allow you to do that. People, no, you can't hate people. But Satan, I can hate him. I despise him. I've seen him destroy so many lives and he makes me so angry. Sometimes I see him do stuff and he makes me so mad, I will literally walk out to my truck and I go, you have made me mad? I'm going to do something for God's kingdom today just to put it in your eye. You make me mad. You destroy people's lives, you tear them apart. And I will continue to love people and hate you. And hate what you do to people. You need to look past their inadequacies and their failures and see the cause that is deep inside of them and hate it and love them. So this is for somebody. 
Our struggle's not against them. And the thing is, for some of you, they're gone. They're dead and gone. How are you going to struggle with them anyway? They're dead and gone. You, you've got to release their sin from you. And you're living frustrated and anger. And in anger because it's blocking you, it's holding you, it's keeping you. But it, see, the problem is, it isn't chained to you. You're chained to it. And you have the key. I want to say that again. That stuff that you think you're chained to. No. It's not chained to you. You're chained to it. And you have the key. You change yourself to it. And God says, look, I've given you the key of mercy and of grace and of my love and of my power and my anointing. Unlock the lock. Release it. Let it go. There's forgiveness. Not only to be forgiven, but to forgive. I can't forgive them. You know what? That's the beautiful thing about God. He will enable you to forgive what you could not forgive in your own strength. You got to grasp that. You say, God, I know I need, but I can't. Just like the guy who said, if you can heal my son, will you? And he said, what do you mean if? Do you believe I can heal? Do you believe? I believe, but help thou my unbelief. He said, let me heal him, and then you won't have a problem with that unbelief. And you see, God, I know I need to forgive this, but I can't. But I'm coming to you. Help me. God, I've got to forgive, and you're going to have to help me because I can't do it on my own. He said, that's good enough for me. I'll help you, and you can forgive him, and you can be freed from it in the name of Jesus right now. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6 tells us very plainly that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. Not psychology, not the world's wisdom. And you can read that on your own. For time's sake, it's time to get to it this morning. There's some of you who need to be set free from some things. Free from yourself. Free from the sins of others. And I've said it many times, but it's just got to get drilled home this morning. You've dealt with your sins, but you're going to have to deal with other people's that you're holding on to. How... We've got to take that and put it on the blood. God, I know that you don't mean for me. It says taking everything that exalteth itself against the name of the Lord and submitting it unto Christ. There are feelings and emotions and hatred and bitterness in your heart that he said we cannot have toward other people. So that is in contradiction. That is pretentious. That is against God. You've got to take that and you've got to make it captive. You've got to put it under the blood. You've got to let God forgive. You've got to go on. You've got to move on. God has a victory in a life for you to live. That's how the weapons of our warfare are mighty. Not through the weapons of psychology, but the weapons of salvation. Not that I rationalize, not that I excuse, not that I deny. No, that I face head on and I forgive. It's a divine thing that God gives us. In 2 Chronicles, I end with this. King Jehoshaphat was surrounded by a great army. And he said, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. There's somebody in this place this morning. Would you bow your heads? Just... I want you to shut yourself in with God. I want you to listen to his voice. There's some of you who are saying even to God right now, but you don't understand what all is happening. Yes, he does. He was there. He was there. How can he let that happen? He didn't. They weren't worried about God's will. They were out of God's will. It was his will that they would live at peace and love with you and to give and love you. But they were out of God's will and because of their sin, you have suffered. So you can't change that. It happened. Sin brought it about. Put the anger where it deserves to be on sin. It was because of their sin. But you've let that sin attach itself to you. And some of you, in all honesty, if I look at it even in my own human understanding, I would say, man, I don't even know if somebody could over, overcome that. As a pastor, I've had people come into my office and share things with me that I don't even want to know. I, did, I still don't want to know. I wish I didn't know. I can't even imagine that people could be that evil and that wicked. And they've suffered so from it. But right now, God's going to set some people free. How am I a godly man among evil I forgive.